once I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, I said to myself, there's no way I'm not going to pull this off. And, uh, you know, that's a bold attitude, but it's the attitude of entrepreneurs. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we talk to athletes, adventurers, and business owners from around the world of adventure sports. Whether you're climbing Mount Everest, starting a bike shop, or getting up off your couch to take your kids hiking for the first time, we want you to have the motivation and inspiration you need to chase that next adventure. The Adventure Sports Podcast is brought to you by Camp Crate, the leaders in fully planned self-guided backpacking adventures, as well as backpacking gear rental. You can check them out at campcrate.net. So there's this new backpacking food company called Peak Refuel. And honestly, I I gave them a shot for my last backpacking trip. Y'all, it was literally the best backpacking food I've ever had in my life. I was so impressed by them that I wanted to reach out and get a deal for our listeners. So if you keep listening to the episode, I'll tell you how to save 20% off an order with them. Hey friends, check out powder7.com, new sponsor for the Adventure Sports Podcast. I've worked with these guys for a couple of years, and two of my sons have bought their most recent pairs of skis there. What's cool is that while they do sell new skis, they also sell previously used demo skis. And these demo skis come with demo bindings, so no need to remount anything. And they are sold for less than half of what you would have to pay otherwise. Great deal, great website, great people. Check out powder7.com. Hey, everybody. For today's Life Outside the Box episode, we interviewed the legendary Colorado photographer, John Fielder, and basically asked him what it was like to build a career out of uh, what you love doing, which for him is taking pictures. And you'll see it. It wasn't easy for many years, a decade, really. Uh, It was difficult. It was uh, questionable whether he was going to make it or not, but you'll see that he he never wanted to quit. Uh, It took a lot of skill. Uh, probably some luck and continuous learning as well as lots and lots of patience. So if you want to hear from a career pursuer of their dream, you're going to enjoy this episode. And if you're just new on the journey of uh, outdoor entrepreneurship, sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy this free advice. Today I have with me uh, a guest who's been on the show a couple times before well-known. A lot of you know him, even if you haven't heard him on here before. His name is John Fielder, and he is Colorado's preeminent nature photographer. John, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Mason. Yeah, thanks for being back on. And this is this is my first time ever talking to you, and it's it's definitely a real treat for me. I've been familiar with your uh, with your photography for years now, so this is just fantastic. Well, it's doubly good when. Uh... Somebody appreciates what I do. I I need pats on the back just like everybody else. Man, I t- <laughs> yeah, I believe it, man. You even the best of the best uh, need encouragement. So, uh, man, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I actually got a chance to look at uh, your new book. Um, it's gorgeous, and so I want to just talk about that real quick. You're doing something a little different this time. Uh, you're kind of taking a page out of old Ansel Adams book uh, and taking the color out of Colorado. You, you know it's called Colorful Colorado, right? Is, is that what those signs are going <laughs> from Utah, New Mexico, Wyoming, and Kansas when you enter Colorado? Oh, yeah, I remember those. It's so, something very different for you. you. You took every bit of color out of this book. You've got 200-plus images all in black and white. So, So what inspired you to do that? Well, you said it, uh, Ansel Adams, my two photographer heroes are Ansel Adams um, because of his extraordinary black and white photography and and his uh, prodigious environmental ethic, and then a man named Elliot Porter, who was the color Ansel Adams of the 20th century, not quite the environmentalist, but he had a remarkable eye for composition, and I learned from both of them. But, yeah, I felt it was time to to eliminate the color out of Colorful Colorado. And when you do, 
one's eye tends to go towards edges and shapes and textures without the distraction of color and it it can be in some ways even more powerful than a color photograph yeah yeah i definitely agree with you uh my, my wife's been trying to get us to get black and white images hung on our walls and i just love color but we went in to uh, the maroon bells this summer just to do uh the some backpacking and when i took a picture of the bells that you know you always see it in color and it's gorgeous and I immediately, I got home and we wanted to hang one up and I changed it to black and white. I immediately loved it twice as much. Something about when I took the color out, it just made the image so dramatic. And it's really counterintuitive, honestly. It's funny that you'd mentioned the maroon bells. Did you make that uh, iconic photograph of the maroon bells reflecting in maroon lake? Yes, and that's the one I did in black and white. I know it's been done before, but... You know, you, you got to take one yourself, you know, even every time you're there. Well, if you want to understand me and my uh, my uh, personal ethic and philosophy, believe it or not, and your listeners won't believe this either, but in 40 years of Colorado photography, I've never stood on the edge of that lake in the summer and the fall to make that classic scene because in the very beginning of my career, I never wanted to do photographs that, you know, might be considered cliche that I wanted to make my living and my reputation. And just, I knew I would enjoy more exploring places that were so remote that maybe very few people had ever been there. But with that said, in this new book, Colorado Black on White, the only photograph I've ever made from Maroon Lake is a black and white photo made uh, in December with um, a partially frozen lake and mist coming off the lake and then snow blowing off the top of the two bells. So it's a time when nobody else does that that scene in the middle of the winter. Yeah, I'm looking at, actually just opened the book, man. It's on page 95. I just took the picture. I just looked at it. <laughs> That's funny. Look at it right there. It's right next to uh, Sunstar and Elk Mountains. So so that's a rare picture for you, huh? Well, listen to this. There was a story behind that, too. I made the photograph in uh, December 1993. Yep, and that's what the caption says. And uh, I had the two previous years volunteered to then U.S. Senator from Colorado, Timothy Worth, to photograph three quarters of a million acres of prospective wilderness in Colorado, mostly high country, so that he would have images, not just boundaries on maps, to show the entire Congress in Washington, D.C., how beautiful these places were and why they should be added to the National Wilderness Preservation System. That's the Wilderness Act of 1964, our highest form of land protection in America. And so on my own volition, I spent a year and a half, you know, backpacking hundreds of miles to get photos so that they could be put into a little book to be given to everybody in Congress so that we could um, partner to get this bill passed. And it worked in 1993. Um we passed the 1993 Colorado Wilderness Bill, which is, I said, um, added three quarters of a million acres to the wilderness system in America. And then NBC Nightly News uh, wanted to do a story about this. So they snowmobiled me up to the lake with Roger O'Neill, the reporter and a photographer. And I was standing with that scene you see in the book in the background with my hand or arm propped up on my camera on a tripod and I was just about ready to do the interview and I turned around and looked at the mist coming off the lake and the snow blowing off the peaks and I said interview suspended turned around got the shot with my medium format Pentax camera then we did the interview and then that night I was on NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw in front of 16 million people. Yeah, I mean, well, that's what's interesting about this book is that uh, 
there's a book full of images in it, but there's almost a book full of words in it as well. There's like a, a half a page of, of text under each picture. And each one of those is talking about the story behind the image is, uh, I mean, did you enjoy that part of the, the process? Well, it wasn't part of the plan. Once I had edited pretty much my life's work into 800 photos that I thought would look good in black and white, and then those down to the 230 that ended up in the book. Whenever I looked at one of those final images, I started thinking about the sensuousness of the moment or maybe something to do with the design, the composition of the photo, or or maybe some background story like I just mentioned. And uh, I felt like just spontaneously writing and I ended up writing 30,000 words of text, which, as you can see, doesn't really distract from it being a picture book. But there's so much in there for people to grasp from tips of places where to go and how to make good photos to just interesting stories like the NBC Nightly News story. Wow. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I've looked through the book a couple times now. I, I absolutely, I used to live in Yosemite, and I became obsessed with uh, Ansel Adams and, and his work and his gallery there. And um, I absolutely loved looking through your book. And a lot of the places I just I just didn't recognize. And I, I, I've been fortunate to see a lot of Colorado. But a lot of those mountains and a lot of those angles just were not familiar to me because they weren't, those popular viewpoints. And so it's not your fault, Mason. Yeah. I, uh, you know, we have 44 wilderness areas in the national wilderness preservation system in Colorado and a total of, uh, 66 million acres across the whole state. And you're talking to somebody who's pretty much been everywhere. I've covered over 40 years, each of 28 mountain ranges. And I've been into the most remote, parts of all of them, and I've photographed almost every alpine lake or group of alpine lakes and the spectacular cirques and drainages of those places, but not to mention the eastern plains and all of the western sandstone river canyons that we have. So, um, yeah, don't feel badly that uh, you don't recognize some of those places because there's not too many of us that have seen everything. Right. Well, yeah, you, you got about you got about ten times as much time as I have out there, but you've also just seen. I mean, you've been just so active in the last forty years doing this. You have accolade after accolade. In fact, I saw I saw that the Pope was gifted one of your books last, uh, earlier this year. Yeah, I had an interesting um, spring. I did a uh, I January through April. I spend skiing one day and then editing photos from the year before in the program called Lightroom the next day. So I kind of go back and forth, but I did some uh, traveling too. And uh, But one of the episodes was a doctor in Denver sending me photos from the Vatican with his brother, who is a priest who works at the Vatican. He's American, but he works at the Vatican. And um, the doctor from Denver and his brother and family gained an audience at the Vatican with the Pope, and they asked me uh, to inscribe a book, my book called Mountain Ranges of Colorado, to the Pope, and they presented it to him, and they made some snapshots of the presentation, and um, sent them back to me, which was quite an honor. But the irony is, a week after I learned that the Pope had received my book, I was in Groton, Connecticut, helping to launch the newest U.S. nuclear Virginia-class submarine called the USS Colorado. I had donated uh, photos to the Navy. They were printed and mounted uh, in the submarine and the cruise quarters and in the mess area in order to um, improve the quality of life with these Colorado photos inside the sub. So that was all in March, and I thought it was kind of ironic that one day the Pope, who represents peace and tranquility, 
is receiving a book of tranquility of Colorado mountains. And the next day I'm, um, helping to facilitate nuclear, uh, warfare. Although before you laugh, if one looks at the history of the Catholic church, no offense, you Catholics out there, but <laughs> they were pretty aggressive for many centuries, uh, promoting their religion. Uh, so maybe it wasn't a, um, uh, Maybe it wasn't opposites after all. <laughs> I, I didn't even put that together, but yeah, what a week. Jeez. You know, and that, that kind of funny. I just read a quote yesterday from Theodore Roosevelt talking about, I, I'm going to paraphrase, I'm going to butcher it, I'm sure. But he said something about, you know, the nations get along better when they spend time outdoors is basically what he was saying. And he's like from, so that just is a great example that no matter where you stand, no matter what you stand for or what you're doing, everyone loves a beautiful scene of nature that will bring anyone at peace. And I think, you know, those two examples prove it immensely. One of the other books I did in my life, and maybe my favorite, is a book called Rocky Mountain National Park, A 100-Year Perspective. And it's out of print, but it was one of the highlights of my life in the summers of 1993 and 1994, I was given a permit by the Park Service, Rocky Mountain, to go and camp and explore wherever I wanted to go, which was antithetical to the park policy, which is there is no overnight camping above tree line anywhere in the park with or without a permit. They yeah, yeah. don't allow it. And I convinced the superintendent of Rocky Mountain to let me have rule of the roost for two years, mostly because I gave them original four by five inch transparency straight out of the camera to keep as a scientific visual record of the ecosystem as of 1994. So I did exactly that. I spent 50 nights in the park above tree line in two summers with four or five Sherpas or young people helping me carry all the gear. And I got effectively to cover the entire 265 square miles on foot. I saw every nook, every cranny, photographed each of 155 alpine and subalpine lakes. But my predecessor was a guy named Enos Mills, who was the father of the park. Who um, The park was made a park in 1916 and in large part because of his advocacy. He was a great photographer and writer and uh, toured the country to make sure that this place became a national park, ultimately not a place to log or to mine. And his writing was very inspirational. And he said, you know, exactly what you said. His philosophy was that there is no greater medicine in life than uh, nature, that nature is a cure-all for all of our travails. And uh, even said in 1900, you know, um, medicine for the hustle and bustle of everyday life, and that's 1900, not <laughs> 2018. Jeez. There's no better medicine than being outdoors in nature, and no better medicine than, than parks. So like I said before, Peak Refuel is a new company making freeze-dried food, and it's literally the best freeze-dried meals I've ever had. You can use it for backpacking, camping, hunting, whatever you want to use it for. And these folks are the real deal. They spent over two years researching the market and creating the perfect recipes. And it is just absolutely awesome. I used the meals on my last guided trip. And the people on the trip could not even believe that it was freeze-dried food. Literally, you put a cup of water in it. It's like a cup or a cup and a half. It's, it's not very much water. And it tastes like it came from a restaurant. That's how good it is. If you're interested in ordering some yourself, you can get 20% off by going to peakrefuel.com and use ASP20 at checkout. I encourage you, go get some, try it for yourself. It's amazing. This is Colorado nature photographer John Fielder with a great idea for gifting our state this season. Don't get mad at me. My latest Colorado book actually takes the color out of colorful Colorado. Carpets of purple columbine, forests of yellow aspens, and buff-colored herds of elk are rendered in black, white, and gray. 
you'll be mesmerized by the edges, shapes, and textures of our most beautiful of states. You'll love it. Visit johnfielder.com to see my new book, Colorado Black on White. That's johnfielder.com. When I graduated from college, I did a, I'd spent about six months bicycling to about 35 national parks, and it absolutely changed my life. But I only got to stay on the roads for most of it. You got to see every square inch of Rocky Mountain. I mean, that's a trip of a lifetime. That must have felt pretty incredible to be in the middle of. Well, mostly because it's such a sublime and prodigious place. In fact, I didn't photograph the park until I'd photographed much of the rest of Colorado because I didn't think I was ready emotionally, artistically for that place with its massive mountains and incredible alpine cirques, glacial basins, lakes, tarns. Um, I just, I was afraid of it that I just couldn't do justice to it. So I kind of waited until halfway through my career. And that's why it was the project of a lifetime because it, it is one of the most extraordinary places on earth, at least you know, mountain alpine areas. Yeah, absolutely. It is, it is at the top of most people's favorite parks if they've been to a number of them. So man, you're not from Colorado originally. So, so why Colorado? What, what led you here? In the summer of 1964, my middle school science teacher, Mrs. Dolly Hickman, who had the habit of taking seven kids in her station wagon. That's kind of like a minivan for you youngsters uh, towing a pop-up camper across the U.S. visiting archaeological, biological, geological, paleontological places. So these are middle school kids going out for five weeks, getting to camp out every night and to see science and nature at its best. And uh, I did it for two summers. The second summer across the middle of the U.S., Campton Rocky Mountain National Park in August of 1964. Saw Long's Peak, compared it in my mind to Mount Mitchell and the Appalachians and realized this <laughs> is the place that I belonged. And I told Mr. Hickman at that moment that I'm at age 14 that I'm going to live here someday. And, and uh, do you know, I befriended her 15 years after graduating high school and after I became a nature photographer, and and we saw each other every year until she died at age ninety five. Wow! And we would talk the trip, and she never forgot that I had told her um, when I was fourteen that I would live in Colorado someday. So that was the first of the felicitous things that happened in my life. And others were I had an uncle that ran a company in Colorado, and he got me jobs working out here in my high school and college summers working on a cattle ranch, working prospecting for gold, silver, copper for his steel corporation around the West in Colorado. So when I got out of Duke University with an accounting degree in 1972, three days later, I was out, out here in Colorado looking for work. Hmm. So how the heck did a teacher, how was she able to take you in a station wagon across the, how'd you sign up for it? How, for only seven kids to be able to go? This is back in the days before society became so litigious. So it was a private school for one. So we had a little more freedom, you know, do, to do things like that. It was in the summer. And, um, and, you know, I don't even think my parents signed anything. I just, you know, <laughs> kids, kids that were invited either said yes or no. And she could fit seven kids plus herself plus another adult to supervise young teenagers, which they weren't able to do actually. Um, which made the trip even more fun. So, it, yeah, very, one of those uh, things in life that um, was uh, formative and remarkable. What, what what a thing for a teacher to do. Spend all summer, or all, spend all school year with a bunch of y'all, little brats, and then have to take seven of you across the country in the summer. <laughs> That's some sacrifice, man. And what a thing to do so she did that for 20 summers you know seven kids, holy cow kids, and every kid was indelibly affected for the rest of their lives they became 
doctors and scientists and nature photographers. And um, whenever I speak to teachers, I always tell the story of Mrs. Hickman and I say, uh, I hope you, you teachers, get the joy of what happened to Mrs. Hickman when, when her student, me, contacted her 15 years later and said to her, you are the reason why I am who I am today. In my case, the nature photographer who started out as a businessman and became a nature photographer by turning one's passion into a new career. But I gave her credit for that. And what a joy that must have been for her to know that her time as a teacher influenced somebody to that degree. No kidding, man. That that had to make that had to make so many hard days uh, worth it for her to hear that. <laughs> that is unbelievable. My wife's a teacher, and it's it's the little things that get them through. But I wouldn't call that a little thing. I'd call that a pre- pretty big uh, victory on her end. So you obviously loved the landscape, and you wanted to be out here. What led you to photography, and how did you begin to get a foothold in the world of photography? Because there's there's a lot of people taking pictures, man. I had another inspiration at that same school in high school. My art teacher, Mr. Tony Birch, was a good one. And even though I wasn't very good with my hands and paints and sculpture, he generated in me a passion for being creative and just trying to discover what was inside of me and expressing it with paints mostly. and. So I had an art background, too, and when I moved to Colorado with my outdoor background, um, I tried to put the two together as a avocation, at least, and taking paints and paintbrushes and canvases into the wilderness didn't work out so well. So I rented a camera in 1973, a 35-millimeter Pentax, and stuck some Kodachrome 25 film in it and put on my running shoes, taped my ankles like a, like football practice. and in my shorts and t-shirts, I would I'd get up at three o'clock in the morning in Denver and drive two two hours and forty five minutes to the Sangre de Cristo Mountains of Southern Colorado, and with a day pack full of camera gear and a little bit of food and water, jog from eight thousand five hundred feet to twelve and a half thousand feet, so I could be there at sunrise and make a photo, and then jog back down. And I just remember people looking at me on the trail. This is before the days of not only running in the mountains, but just running in general. And this is the early 70s, looking at me like I was absolutely nuts. So, yeah, art background and passion for the outdoors, put those two together, and then ultimately some business skills and accounting degree. And that's what allowed me to make a living over the last um, 37 years. So was it difficult at first? Absolutely. But fun. You know, my eye was horrible. I made bad photos, but by looking at Ansel Adams' work and Elliot Porter's, and I didn't have the time or the resources to take classes or go to workshops like I teach today, and it was a matter of trial and error of making my slides and coming back and comparing my images to those of those two great photographers and trying to figure out um, organically what what was wrong? Why didn't mine look like theirs did? And by hook and crook and trial and error and, you know, admitting my failures, but also giving myself credit for my successes. You know, I don't think there's any learning process better than by the seat of one's pants and did that for seven or eight years as a hobby. And then felt like I was ready to quit my um, first career, which was the department store business and see if I could make a living out of nature photography. So was was trying to forge a living out of your photographs a little more rewarding than a department store management? Ironically, uh, yes, but not quite in the way that you might think that they might be polar opposites because setting up a department in a department store with umpteen colors of towels on a wall or alligator shirts takes visual skill and the visual skill to attract the butterfly to the flower, the shopper to the merchandise, 
in some ways is no different than the skill of composing a color photo to attract the viewer to the book, to the print, to the slide. And um, some of the things I learned that way artistically lent to making good photos, but especially the merchandising skill, learning how to sell was critical to the business side of my career. How could I, I mean, it's one thing to make a pretty picture as most creative people know, it's another thing entirely to be able to sell it. And my merchandising skills, and as I said, my accounting degree and my business skills to run a business um, were absolutely critical to being able to ultimately make a living. There are so many people making beautiful pictures, even back then, I'm sure. How did how did you set yourself apart? What When did you first start seeing like, wow, I can make money doing this? No, that's a good question. Mason, because, yeah, everybody would, I mean, anybody who spends time outdoors would love to make a living out of being outdoors, and photography is one of the best ways to express oneself and and what you see and what you feel. Um, so, yet, how did I break in? Um, well, my eye wasn't that good, and there were other photographers far better than I was artistically, but I did it by starting a publishing company. I couldn't find any New York publishers to publish my work because I was just one more unknown nature photographer aspiring. So with my business skills, merchandising background, I started my own publishing company, borrowed a little money from my dad, printed a my 1982 Colorado scenic wall calendar and hooked it to every bookstore and gift shop in the state, like 140 stores and all but one took my product because it was like a Sierra Club calendar. Really, I mean, decent photography, good printing, but about Colorado. And back in those days, there weren't really any other good calendars about Colorado. There were some dime store calendars. That was it. So I found a niche in the market for something that didn't exist and something that people wanted was a good looking Colorado calendar for their wall. And that was my first published product, and then I published my first coffee table book, and um, again, there wasn't much competition. And the theory was not only tourists, but people who lived here in Colorado wanted things to send back to their friends and relatives in New Jersey and Texas and wherever and kind of twist the knife. Look where I live, and you don't. <laughs> I know I do that a little bit. <laughs> So you were you it was hustle it sounded like I mean you were able to find a niche you you went and you couldn't find anybody to publish your work so you started your own publishing company I mean that that's some hustle man and then you just send it out and you get no's I'm sure lots of no's originally um but now I walked into Tattered Cover the other day uh, I had some family visiting and I wanted to take them there and you have an entire wall of your books on display in the Tattered Cover bookstore in downtown Denver. So you go from being one of the calendars on the shelf to having an, an entire wall to yourself. And it's probably just been lots of little steps like that along the way that have got you there. Well, yeah, you said hustle, and, and for me it's perseverance. I Once I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, frankly... I said to myself, there's no way I'm not going to pull this off. And, uh, you know, that's a bold attitude, but it's the attitude of entrepreneurs. And, you know, I found out after being in a career where I was an employee that I was meant to be somebody, you know, making their own decisions and making their own mistakes and gaining their own successes, that that was more satisfying for me, so it took somewhat of that mentality, but definitely there's no way I'm going to fail. And, uh, you know, that, but that takes thoughtfulness. It's, it's not, um, quite as capricious as it sounds. It means you got to have a good plan, a good financial plan. You got to have some financing. So yeah, my dad loaned me a little bit of money to help get that calendar printed, but then, in order to print expensive coffee table books, I had to find a venture capitalist and I sold him half my company and, and he got me bank loans and, and, uh, lent me money so I could print these, uh, other things. And, and, uh, then you gotta have 
backup plans for plans. If it doesn't work out, what are you going to do? And uh, so really, it was just classic entrepreneur covering all the bases. But again, more than anything else, it's that, like you implied, that force of will that uh, I am not going to fail. By now, you certainly know who Bent Gate is. That's for a great reason. Bent Gate Mountaineering has been sponsoring the Adventure Sports Podcast almost from the beginning, and we really appreciate that. They've made it possible for all the great shows to continue coming your way. We want to say thanks by reminding you to go to them for your backcountry gear. If you live in Colorado, then just stop by their store in Golden. If not, go to bentgate.com. They have what you need from the latest ultralight gear to the tried and true classics for climbing, hiking, and camping, like Arcteryx, Hilleberg, Nemo, Western Mountaineering, and many more. Need advice? They have you covered there, too. Their staff are passionate adventurers who can offer help from their own experiences. Bentgate also hosts lots of events and speakers. Check out their website to see the schedule and to see all of their products. Help take care of the Adventure Sports Podcast by getting your gear from Bentgate Mountaineering. Born from logging and exploration, Danner Boots is a Pacific Northwest original. Every boot is handmade to hold up in unforgiving conditions and live up to their unyielding standards. The Stronghold Work Boot is what happens when more than 85 years of legendary quality, durability, and heritage runs into modern construction, technology, and materials. You get tomorrow's classic today, the Stronghold Work Boot. Check them out or find a local store at danner.com. Were there ever times that it seemed like it wasn't going to work for you? Absolutely. That's what every entrepreneur goes through. And we didn't make a whole lot of money for my partner and me until about 10 years later. But what we did do was prove that there was a niche in the market for high-quality photographic souvenirs, whether calendars or coffee table books or guidebooks. And um, it just was a matter of getting everything to line up so we could bring money to the bottom line. And ultimately, it involved not just me photographing Colorado and publishing my own work, but hiring other photographers, nature photographers like me, all around the country to do similar books and calendars of other states. So in its heyday, my company, West Cliff Publishers, was publishing products like I do in Colorado and 35 other states. And that, you know, allowed me to make a decent living and to begin to raise a family while I, you know, traveled. So, yeah, did you ever... Did you ever want to quit? Absolutely not. Once you get a taste of uh, being able to go out 30 weeks a year or 20 weeks a year to spend your days and your nights, your sunrises in wilderness, uh, kind of hard to go back. So no, there was never any thought of uh, going back into the department store business or being in a an accountant, but we did, we did well, or we, you know, again, we, there was a niche in the market for these kinds of products back in the eighties when I started and still is, but today, of course, it's a little different with the web, but nevertheless, um, we, we found what people wanted and we provided it to them. And I was the lucky beneficiary of that feeding photos to people while getting to have a pretty incredible lifestyle in the out of doors. Yeah, no kidding, man. That is that's exciting. So did the did the pressure to to provide for your family change the way you take pictures or did you just say what I think's get most beautiful is probably what other think will, other people will think is most beautiful. Yeah, that's a good point, Mason. Um sometimes one makes photos for one's own inner self versus what might be more commercially viable, but um, it was never a conflict. Uh, I, I must say, I do love photographing intimate landscapes, which is what Elliot Porter called the landscape without the crutch of a horizon and sky, where you're just photographing textures and details and colors within nature, which uh, you'll see in my 
annual Colorado engagement calendars more than you'll see scenics. And the scenics tend to go in the wall calendars, but people love that, that kind of thing too. And this new book, Colorado Black on White, is going to be a real good test to see, you know, how many people out there really appreciate Ansel Adams and, and what black and white has to offer instead of color because it's not that, you know, massive display of colorful Colorado that's so attractive, um, to folks. So no, I didn't really have to compromise what I was doing. The only, uh, compromises were on the part of my children and wife as they were growing up who, uh, when dad went out for a week with the old fashioned large format four by five view camera on his back, it would cost me two dollars to uh, buy a sheet of four by five Fuji chrome film and another two dollars and fifty cents to have it processed. So every time I pushed the shutter, that was almost five bucks, and I would shoot five hundred sheets in a week. So that's twenty five hundred dollars to come home with a week's worth of photos, which meant that the kids didn't eat very well the week after that. Oh man, oh man, that is crazy. So even then, it was a it was a struggle trying trying to build this career. For sure, but uh, you know, we stuck with it. The family supported me. Coloradans and others supported me, and uh, it all worked out in the end. So I'm I'm very fortunate. That's really cool. I I, I never knew any of that. And can I ask you this? You know, photography. I feel like is is it's changed a lot since you started. And the sheer volume of beautiful pictures is uh, is just ma- when you look at stats of how many pictures are being taken year after year, it's it's kind of mind blowing. It's almost scary how frequently someone is snapping a picture and how easily it can be posted. Has the onset of internet galleries through places like Facebook and Instagram has that changed? the way you approach your business? Somewhat. Uh, It probably changes the way that a new photographer would consider how to make a career. I still have one foot in the old-fashioned way and now one foot in the new way. So because I've been doing this for so long, I still am able to sell a new coffee table book or new calendars every year traditionally through bookstores, which of which there's still plenty, and but also new kinds of retail, like Costco carries my books and calendars, and thank goodness Barnes & Noble is still around. And But on the other hand, yeah, photos are a dime a dozen, and we don't do much stock photography anymore where I might sell or lease a transparency to an advertising agency to do an ad in Time Magazine, for example, and that used to make us a pretty good fee, but because photos are a dime a dozen, that end of the business is no longer viable. So I spread my work around and and market myself in different ways, whether books and calendars, or I, I love teaching photography workshops and my fine art print business where I decorate walls in homes and offices and institutions is a viable business. But my marketing has changed. For example, this year, for the new Colorado Black on White book, I have gone almost completely digital and SEM search engine marketing and, and via my website and through Google and Facebook, I'm promoting, um, digitally and electronically and socially this new book in ways that I've never promoted books before. So do you enjoy learning those new skills? I guess you have to if you want to keep doing this. <laughs> Kind of. I must say, I, as much as I am love, I love engaging with people. I do, you know, 30 or 40 slideshows to thousands of people around Colorado and beyond every year. And that's one of the highlights of my year is being face to face with people who love the same things I love. But I'm not very gregarious in terms of, uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. I just, I'm, private and I like sharing what I do in the ways that we've been discussing but uh, socially in the me- social media I'm not very aggressive but this time of the year when there's books to be sold I get a little more aggressive 
But I, you know, I hire other people to do that for me. So I have a company in Colorado Springs, a social SEO, who helps me with a lot of these electronic ways in which to market myself that I might not do well all by myself. The Adventure Sports Podcast is also brought to you by Powder 7 Ski Shop. Powder 7 is Colorado's premier homegrown and family-owned ski shop. Online at powder7.com, they offer a huge selection of new and used ski gear, plus full tech and boot fitting services at their shop in Golden. With personalized customer service, they set up skiers from all over the world with perfect gear. From brands like Kessley, Rosignol, Black Crows, and Head, Powder 7 is all skiing all the time. So check out powder7.com to learn more. Now, back to the episode. Yeah, and I mean, that's honestly smart. Why you're you're good at what you do. Why don't you, instead of trying to learn an entirely new skill, just hire it out, and it saves you probably a lot of headache. And honestly, <laughs> man, if I could get rid of all this social media stuff, I would. It's such a headache. If there's a, if there was a just way that I didn't have to stare at a screen and, and get all this work done, it's so crucial in today's world, but I honestly can't stand it. Um, life is so much better without it, in my opinion. Well, I have to tell you, I, you may lament all the time you spend on the computer for for the social and uh, marketing aspect. I'm on the computer most of the winter editing in Lightroom, the processing program from Adobe, my photos, because they it's one thing to take a digital photo, but it's another to make it look the way the eye sees, and that requires, you know, processing it electronically. So I get my share of... Uh, of uh, screen viewing, just like you do, and it's part of the deal, and uh, I actually love it because it's a very artistic process, just like converting all of those color photos, which is exactly what I did electronically into black and white was a real joy. That's great, man. Do you see yourself doing more of these, black and white? I don't know. Uh, We will see, see how people embrace it, and... uh, you know, the thing that I enjoy the most is just being outdoors. These days, I'm not so much project-oriented as I was early in my career where I would specifically go hike the entire Colorado Trail or Continental Divide Trail or cover the entire Rocky Mountain National Park specifically to produce a book about those things. Now, I tend to do these accumulations of photos from my lifetime that fit together in some cogent way and this most recent one is black and white and who knows what it'll be next year although i kind of got an inkling of what it might be actually oh yeah what's that well i don't want to let the cat out of the bag but one of the things i love doing is panoramic photos in fact now with digital cameras i can take up to nine or ten verticals one right next to the other as i kind of rotate around and uh, it's advantageous because I don't end up with uh, fisheye distortion, which you get with wide-angle lenses when you're trying to photograph a big part of the landscape. So now I'll cock the camera vertical either on the tripod or handheld, and I'll make, like I said, anywhere from four to nine verticals slightly overlapping each one. And then in Lightroom or Photoshop, I can stitch them all together seamlessly and end up with files sometimes 40,000 pixels across by 8,000 pixels high. And I have a number of clients who like to cover massive institutional walls, 300 feet long sometimes or more, with a big mural. And we print these photos on wall pa- adhesive wallpaper and then seamlessly uh, mount them in strips to to do this. But the product of that are a lot of these really long panoramic images that I was thinking might make a nice book someday. So imagine a a book that might be 20 inches long by 10 inches high, but the binding wouldn't be on the left. The binding would be at the top. So you would actually flip the book, book open from bottom to top to get from page to page. Oh, that would be so fantastic. I absolutely love panoramas. Your listeners heard it here. Okay, heard it here first, huh? <laughs> That's incredible. So, uh, yeah, as we wrap up, I'd love to know uh, 
just share with us what, what's been what's been something that's come easy over the years to bu- to build your career, and what's something that's been surprisingly difficult. That's a tough one, um, but let me see if I can think on my feet because that's what I basically got to do. Well, yeah, by the seat of your pants. The wilderness. You just told half me to do of that. And half planned, and the other half is spontaneous, reacting to light and changing weather quickly. So let's see if I can think on my feet. Well, I think the one of the easiest things is falling in love with four billion years of the evolution of life on Earth, that when you have seen the sublime places that I've seen, not just here in Colorado, but around America and North America and around the planet and under conditions of light and weather that are sometimes uh, impossible to describe and hard to believe that you were there at that moment in time, but easier to maybe show in a photo um, that part was easy, and you know that's why I became an environmentalist after a while because uh, of that fortune to see just how special life is on planet Earth. I think the hard thing sometimes is communicating that. You know, I spend half my life now not photographing, but talking to people and talking about issues and trying to get people to understand. Again, how fortunate we are to be a two-armed, two, two-legged, two-eyed, Homo sapien on a planet in a solar system, in a in a galaxy, in a universe, in a multiverse. And you know, it's tough sometimes with all the things we got to deal with in life to, at arm's length, realize how lucky we are to be a sentient being and to appreciate all these things, whether it's friends or family or nature and you know getting people to vote the right way and to think the right way um because that's what it takes in the end to protect it is society is making laws and sticking with those laws and thinking long term and wanting to be unselfish and allow our kids and grandkids to enjoy the same things we have you know there's some there's some hard heads out there um that i gotta crack these days to get them to think the right way and vote the right way. That's been the toughest part is sometimes sharing the miracle of life on earth with other people who I know they appreciate it deep down inside, but they don't act like that sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I definitely have experienced that myself. And I, and I think the best, the best medium that you can get people in to be open to those new ideas is exactly what you're doing getting them out there, showing it to them through pictures, and hopefully ins- that inspires them to go out there, see it for themselves, and essentially be changed. Because there, there's nothing that's had the effect on me like the outdoors. And it's I know that you're exactly the same in that sense. Mason, you just uh, concluded one of the best interviews I've ever done. I can't imagine an interview ending on a point any better taken than what you just said. Oh, man, I I appreciate it. Good for both of us. Thanks again. Yeah, have a good one. Hey, thank you so much for listening. If you know somebody that would make a good guest on the show, or if you have a pretty cool story about the outdoors or adventure sports that you want to tell us, please call us and leave a voicemail at 812-MAIL-POD. That is 812-624-624. Five seven six three. Uh, you can also send us an email at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. Uh, again, it is always helpful to leave us a review on iTunes. And if you'd like to be a supporter of the show, you can give five bucks a month at patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. And links for all that stuff is also in the show notes. So thanks again for listening and y'all get out there and do something so you can be on the show one day all right later don't forget if you want to save 20 percent off the best backpacking food you're ever going to eat go to peakrefuel.com and use asp20 at checkout